9, and we're going to read as our beginning text the first seven verses of the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? But Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Thank you, and you may be seated. As we consider the person of Jesus Christ, the thing that stands out to me most about Jesus is his love for humanity. And in that process, the way he described the human condition. And this is important. For Jesus most accurately described the human condition. Our condition is one of tremendous need. The British writer Oscar Wilde dying on his deathbed and he'd lived a life of absolute total rebellion against God in every way every shape and every form in fact his words to his lover His lover was named Robbie Ross. That would tell you something about Oscar Wilde's life. His words to him, Robbie, only God is big enough to save this heart of mine now. Ironically, he lived his life apart from God, yet on his deathbed he understood that everything he had done was in opposition. Don't wait until that point to seek God. You see, Jesus looks at the human condition, and he understands the human condition, and he knows the human condition. You look in the Bible at all the healings that Jesus did, Clearly, you're the blind man that is healed, the sick, the lame, even raising people from the dead. You see, Jesus most accurately describes the human condition. But much more than being in these frail bodies of dust that are going back to dust, he described the condition of the human heart. Listen to what it says in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 and 23. The words of Jesus, for from within Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All of these things proceed from within and defile the man. You see, Jesus most accurately described the human heart. The problem is with evil is not so much that it's out there and we see it everywhere out there but the real problem with evil again is not that it's out there but it is in my heart and Jesus comes on the scene he says when we admit that it's in our heart and we need a savior then 
I can go from living a life that has no answer to having the answer. And I want to say this to you, my friends, today. The answer to your life is Jesus Christ. There is no other answer. There is no other hope. The scripture says it over and over again in Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately wicked. Who can, who can heal this, this heart of mine? Have you ever really and truly looked at yourself? Now, the Bible wants you to love yourself. God wants you to love yourself. But in that loving myself, I have to be honest with myself also. And it is, I have the liberation of knowing Jesus Christ and having his presence and his spirit filling my life. <laughs> Romans right there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks God. For we've all turned aside. There is none who does good, not even one. And don't, don't patronize me, and I'm speaking to the world now, by telling me that man is inherently good. In fact, as Paul writes about his goodness, if he wanted to, to play that card, the irony of life is the better you look by the world's standards, in other words, the more you try to live a life that is good, the more you become acutely aware of your own sinfulness and wickedness. Jesus accurately describes the human condition, and it's not good. The idea that, well, man is basically good is certainly not true. But then that also brings us to the point of observing man's dilemma. The dilemma of, of, of man, the problem of man, the dilemma. And that is that man is stuck because he cannot cure himself. And I want to, I want to say this. I want you to listen to me. I want to go back to Acts 17 here. You remember the story of Paul coming into Athens. And, and Athens, of course, at this time, is the most cultured city in the world. And he comes into the marketplace there, and his heart is struck. And then he, he meets two groups of philosophers. Remember those? Remember who they were? They are the Epicureans and who? The Stoics. Now, it's ironic that um, uh, by the time Paul comes on the scene and walks into Athens, there is this overwhelming sense of skepticism. And let me just say something about skepticism, because we live in a very skeptical world today. Skepticism is the product of people that have no hope. Listen to me. Skepticism is the product of people who have no hope whatsoever at all. And that's where America is today. We are living without hope. So, I want you to understand this. When skepticism takes over, people don't worry about the really big questions of life. What is the biggest question of life? The biggest question of life better be, where am I going to spend eternity? <laughs> because that's a long, long, long time. But then, when skepticism comes in, we get stuck on the little things, like, how much money do I have? How can I have fun the next 10 years of my life when they put me in a nursing home or something like that? You know, so, so we, we're really concentrating on the big things of life. We're thinking about how we can just in the few years that I have on earth live the life that quote unquote makes me the happiest. Is that not where America is stuck today? Absolutely living for the moment but let me tell you this, when Jesus comes into your life, things transform because you don't have a moment. You have eternity. And eternity is way too long to get it wrong. Well, the Epicureans were, and it's kind of kind of actually sad, uh, the Epicureans, they believed that the best thing in life was to seek pleasure. But, but don't take this. We're not talking about a high school freshman, you know, kind of going off and, and partying. Because they had kind of been down this road by the time they came along. And so, anyway, they said pleasure has to be in, in moderation. I mentioned this before, I talk about this a lot, but they full well understood that principle of the hedonistic paradox, and that is this. 
The more you seek pleasure, the more it will bring what into your life? Pain. You look at anybody that's just lived a life like that, they wind up experiencing tremendous pain. So, so the Stoics were kind of like, okay, there is nothing left, but we've got to live this pleasurable life. But we understand that if we go hog wild in it, that will create problems. So those are the Stoics. Excuse me, the Epicureans. And the Stoics, of course, they said, okay, th their big principle is this, that we have to remain clear-minded and make decisions, but ultimately there is no hope. That's where we find America today. But I want you to listen to some words from Paul's sermon as he preached to these people. Listen to what he says. The God who made the world and all things in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Praise God for that. I really don't care. There's an argument in the Holy Land of whether the tomb of Jesus was in a place they call Gordon's Calvary or it was in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. You know what? It doesn't matter who's right. Because Jesus is not in a tomb, but he's resurrected from the dead. We don't argue over that point. <laughs> it, it's interesting. <laughs> and I've always been interested in archaeology. It's an interesting point. But not one bit does it change my salvation. Because God is not an idol in a temple. Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool, the scripture says. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. <laughs> you know, kind of in the, in the old pagan philosophy is, you know, we go to the temple and we take care of God because God lives in the temple. No. What is so unique about the person of Jesus Christ is this, that he doesn't take care. We don't take care of him, but he takes care of us. Think of that for a moment. And Paul went on to say this. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the bounds of their habitations, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Now I want you to understand this. In all of this melee of ideas about God, the Bible says he's not far from any of us. If we will come to him and put our faith and trust in him, we can have a relationship with him. And I want you to listen to this. In, in opposition to this skepticism, on the one hand, we seek this kind of just, just very clear judgment way of thinking. And, and then the Epicureans say, no, the whole purpose of life is to live pleasure because we're dying. It's going to all be over very quickly. I want you to listen to what Jesus says here as he writes to the Apostle Paul. Listen to this. For in him we live and move and exist. We have our being in him. It is wrapped up in him. That's the end. The end of everything is in a relationship with Jesus Christ, and he gives us that right to eternal life. Now, I want you to think of this. This dilemma is, is seen here. So how can man help himself? How can man help himself? The answer to that is man cannot help himself. We need help, and we need that in the person of Jesus Christ. But I want you to live your life not based on the little picture. God never intended us to be focused on the, the little picture. I want you to think of how big God is. God created you for an eternal life, not, not just 70, 80 years down here. God created you for a relationship with him. God created you for the greatest relationship in the world. The Bible says that we are his inheritance, and he is our inheritance. Start thinking big. Let me just say this. The problem with us is we need to make sure we get our God right. Our God is not money. Our God is not pleasure. Our God is not power. Our God is the living God who gives us the hope of eternal life. I want you to just put that in your mind and think about it. Think on the big things. Think on eternal life. See, skepticism, that's why everybody today is so focused on little things and they're so selfish and they want the pleasure of the moment. They say in their hearts, that's all there is. The sadness of a dying world is what is available, and they are settling for so much less. Amen. Truly, the God of the world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ should shine unto them. Let me just say something to you. 
in all honesty? You see, as Paul wrote, in him we live and breathe and move and have our very being. All of what we have comes from God, does it not? Everything that we have comes from God. He is our sustainer. And, and I see this, and I think this is, and I mentioned this before, I know, but I think this is, is the biggest error, the biggest mistake people make in trying to live the Christian life. We understand what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, that we're saved by faith through grace, that not of ourselves, the gift of God, so no one may boast. And we try to come to Christ sincerely, try to accept him as Savior, sincerely, and we do. But then having come to him, we try to live the Christian life on our own. Let me just say this. The Christian life has to be lived in obedience unto God. Obedience is extremely important. Following, doing what he says. If you're having trouble living the Christian life, let me tell you two things I think that will transform your ability to live the Christian life. Number one, obey him. That means spending time with him, doing what he says, praying, reading, those things. But here's the other aspect of that. As you live the Christian life, you cannot do it in your own power. It was never intended that you live the Christian life in your own steam, your own ability, your own power. Everything about the Christian life is to be lived in the person of Jesus Christ. If you are trying to live the Christian life without Christ, and ask yourself that. Ask yourself if you're honest with yourself. When's the last time I really asked God, Give me, as Brother Black would say, a double portion of his spirit. When was the last time I really asked God to help me? As the scripture says in the model prayer, deliver me from temptation because, God, some of these things are just too big for me. To try to live the Christian life without dependence upon Christ is going to wind up in utter failure. Remember, Jesus most accurately described the human condition. Did he not come to save you? Did he not come to give you strength to live the Christian life on a day-by-day -day basis? The question is, then, do I want to live the Christian life? Because if you want to live it, and you're at that point of being frustrated because you're not living it the way you'd like to, and that is somewhat good to recognize that I'm not living it the way I should, then how can I? Not in our power or strength, but in his Get in the habit every day. Talk to Jesus. Ask him to give you strength to live the Christian life. We move on. But then we notice the divine human at work. Jesus. So incredible. In verse 3 of chapter 9, it says this. Jesus answered. Remember the question? Who sinned, this man or his parents, so this man would be born blind? And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so the work of God might be displayed in him. Now, as we think of God's glory, some people were talking to me recently about the eclipse, and of course that wasn't able to be viewed very well from here because of the weather, but... Some people that had traveled to view it talked about how incredible the sight was and how it was much more than they ever thought they would see and the color and the things of that nature. And I told them that when I think of what God has done in this world, the passage that always comes to my mind is the 19th chapter of the book of Psalms. The heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Now, it would seem a contradiction to say in verse 2 when it says, day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. And verse 3 says, there is no speech, nor there are words. But you know what that means? The person that um, uh, talked to me about this said, I don't know how to describe this, but when I saw it, and this is not a perhaps a, deeply spiritual person, at least in my estimation. There was something that overcame me. There was something that stirred within my soul. Now think of that. Day-to-day force for speech, 
Night to night reveals all knowledge, yet there is no speech. When you sense the Spirit of God, not one word has to be said, does it? Amen. Even looking at creation, there's a sense. I am staring into the handiwork of God. Yes, there are certain scientific laws, but who established those laws? Who established and did everything that we see? And let me say this. If God is at work in creation, how much more is God at work in the apex of his creation? And whom did he create in his image? He created us in his image for relationship with him. So this man's sickness, this man's blindness is not about who sinned. Yes, we could talk about the concept of original sin and preach on that subject all day long. But Jesus is saying, this was so that the glory of God might be displayed in him. I am the light of the world. Have you ever thought about the glory of God? Now, again, I want you to contrast the condition that Jesus described the world in, the sickness, the pain, the suffering, the sinfulness, the separation from God, and and. Looking at that dilemma, man stuck in this case, and then a skepticism has come over because we don't think things can be any better, and we don't even focus on God anymore. I mean, how illogical is it? You know, it's like, you know, let's go buy some burial plots or something like that. Well, that's good stewardship. This world is not my home. Retirement planning. Well, that's good stewardship. We need to do those things. But that should be kind of an afterthought for you. If the focus of your life is going on, where are they going to bury me? Or the focus of your life is, you know, what retirement home are they going to put me in? And th those are very good ministries. Don't get me wrong. But should not the focus of my life be on much more than that? Should not the focus of my life be on something eternal? And I want you to notice, I want you to think of this, look at society. There's a skepticism that has overcome our society. That's why you have this preoccupation with pleasure and other things. Because, and I want to say this, man has given up on God. I want you to think of that. We have given up on the really important things in life. And life becomes one party. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. But I want you to listen in contrast to that with what it says in the book of Ephesians. The other night, Brother Floyd brought one of these passages out in, in the Bible study, but the book of Ephesians is one of my favorite passages. Chapter 1 is such an incredible passage. And here we read these words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And I want you to listen to this. I want you to listen to this. I want you to get this. Against this sense of giving up, the person that has not given up on us is the person of Jesus Christ. Listen to this over and over again. Number one, what he's done for us. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us. He chose us when? Before the foundation of the world. We are chosen in him. Wow. Now I'm seeing the big picture. He chose me that we would be holy and blameless before him. Think of that now. Now I'm really seeing the big picture. That I am going to stand in his presence. And all these flaws, all these problems, everything wrong with me, everything that is wrong will be made right. The beauty of Christ, the beauty of God, is that everything that's wrong with us can be undone as if it had never, ever happened. He reverses everything. Wow. You ever think of this? And I don't want this to sound crass or not representing the holiness of God. But it is almost as if he is walking behind me with a big eraser. And every mistake I've ever made, he's erasing that. Because when God looks at me, he doesn't look at my sinfulness but he looks at the holiness of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, 
It says, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Wow. I've just been brought into the greatest family in the whole world. <gasps> Think of that. I want, I want you to contrast this with those. How can I give up on God? How can I recognize what he's doing? to the praise of the glory of his grace. <laughs> Philippians says it so well. He who hath begun a good work in us will perform it in the day of Christ Jesus. I view this incredible scene in my mind that one day, before the whole created universe, or at least the redeemed universe, he who hath begun a good work in us the one that has never given up on us, the one that sealed us with his Holy Spirit the moment we came to him. Now you think of that. No artist will sign an auto autograph, a painting, until it is finished. But you know who autographed you from the very beginning? He sealed you with the Holy Spirit. When no one else would believe in you, you know what God said? My son died for your sins, and I have sealed I put my brand on you. You belong to me. No one will steal you away from me. No one will pluck you out of my hand. And he will hold us up before the assembled universe. And he will say, this is my finished product. Now, now just put your name in that, whatever your name is. And I'll use mine, Tim. But I'll be held up before the entire universe not only to me, and say, this is what I can do. Look at that. That we would be to the praise of the glory of his grace. The next, in that we have redemption through his blood. He died on the cross for me. To an inheritance which he has prepared for us, as Peter writes, that is incorruptible, undefiled, and will never, ever, ever fade away. Now, skepticism, focusing on little teeny things, focusing on the temporary, focusing on the sinful, focusing on momentary pleasure. For anybody with an IQ above 50, ought to become in the rearview mirror. You think of that. Satan not only blinds your soul, but next week we're going to talk about how Satan blinds your mind. Again, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whom the God of this world had blind, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Let me just ask you this. How smart is it to live as if there's no God? when you're going to meet him in a few years? We're not even talking necessarily about a spiritual thing here. Anyone with any cognitive ability whatsoever at that moment would take <laughs> Pascal's wager. You know Pascal's wager? He writes this to his unbelieving friend. If you're right and there is no God, and I live like there is one, what have I lost? But if I'm right, Pascal writes to his friend, that there is a God, and you choose to live as if there is not one, what have you lost? Now, I wouldn't build my theology on Pascal's wager. But if you're talking about simple intellect, what makes sense Logically, that makes a whole lot of sense. And that brings us to our final point. The work of Christ to save us. And then the decision of the human. So, it's ironic, isn't it? This uh, blind man that was healed, Jesus made the clay, the 
the moist clay out of the, the spit and applied it to his eyes. Now, the miracle has not yet taken place. Because verse 7 says, he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I thought about that. So he would have had to go, you know, he's blind, he can't see, kind of feeling, maybe, you know, trying to get somebody to take him. That would have been kind of embarrassing. Let me ask you this. How many people have not received God's miracle because they were worrying about what someone else would think? But he went to the pool of Siloam, and he washed, and he came back seeing. Think of that. What is my decision? What is my decision? I want to bring this service to an end with this illustration. And I had to get permission to use the illustration. It's actually a text. And I'm going to read this text to you from my phone. Yesterday, I texted Brother Jim Lewis a couple of times, and he texted me something back. And we're praying for Jim because, of course, Jim is dealing with a very difficult illness, cancer. But he said something here that really struck me. And I asked him by text, Jim, is it okay if I share that with the congregation? I would not do that without having his permission to share that. And he said, yes, but it's not in the text where he gave me permission, which he said a lot of good things in that text too. But this is the text before that, the one that I had asked him about. He said this, I hope to be able to attend church again one day. But if not, brothers, stay strong in the faith and don't compromise on the truth. And that's not really what I wanted to say, but I put that in there because that is my personal concern, that I do not compromise. That is very important to me. And I hope it's important to you, that you stay strong in the faith. Let the Holy Spirit lead. You have the most important human-oriented shepherding job on earth right now. And I'm confident, and this is the part that I really wanted to get to, but I wanted to put it in context with the others. And I am confident that when you meet the Lord, you'll receive that special reward for pastors. But this is the point right here that I really wanted to focus on. And I plan to be right there to applaud. Love your brother. You know, if you think of that, Jim clearly sees the big picture. Amen. And those that see the big picture focus on the person of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what disturbs me about those that claim to be Christians today. I want you to listen to me carefully. Remember what the scripture says about the wheat and the tares? The disciples said, should we, we come now and sort them? Remember what he said? No. Wait until the end of the age and I'll do the sorting. I'll do the sorting. Now, clearly there's a case for church discipline in Matthew 18, but, but a lot of times the Lord says, just, just leave it alone. I'll do the sorting. Listen to me, my friends. I'm very concerned about those Christians that want to see how close they can get to the world instead of separating themselves from the world. If there was ever a person I met that separated themselves from the world, it was Jim Lewis. You know what the glory of a person that perhaps is getting ready to see the Lord is? Let me tell you, 
And I've noticed this over the years. There's some that say, well, at least I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. And that's good. And then there are those, Miss Eleanor, like Brother Jesse, that can't wait to get there. Now, which am I? Am I the one that hopes it's true, but I've never lived my life in such a way as to know it's true? Sin will rob your confidence. As you get close to the world, it'll rob your assurance of what you know is there. Don't you want to be that believer who is so focused on the world that when the end of life is staring you in the face, you can say, I can't wait to be there. Jesus most accurately describes, of all people, the human condition. And he did something about it. He came and died to give us that hope of eternal life. I want you to look at your condition right now. Are you focused on the person of Jesus Christ? If you're focused on anything else right now, ask God to help you focus on him and put him first. Let's stand as we come to time to close the service.